Hello and welcome to F-Bone. Today I am going to be showing you how to do the join for our snow flurry cowl pattern. This technique is the same for any of our cowl patterns and the patterns, the, the cowl patterns we've done so far have all got the instructions written down on how to do the join but I figured it would be a bit easier for you to be able to see it in a video. So if you've already watched our how to warp up a loom and how to weave on a loom video you will already have loom ready warped up and also you hopefully have woven plenty along to get to this next stage where we're going to start. Now in the written instructions that come with the cowl pattern, it says to weave up to 50 centimetres from where you've tied onto the apron rod at the back. The reason why I say weave up to 50 centimetres instead of weave X amount of centimetres and inches is because this section at the back is actually that length is a more important length. What you've done before here can vary depending on the types of yarns you've used, your tension that you've used, um, various different factors, how hard you've beaten. So it's actually better to measure what is left than what you've already done. So to measure how much we've got left, then, I'll just turn the loom over so you can see it a bit easier. It is where the apron rod is, where that has come to, and where the yarns are tied on. And we just get measuring tape and roughly just hold that onto there, flip it back around and you see 50 centimetres is about there. Now I'm a couple of centimetres short of where I've stopped, I'm not too bothered about that because this is a demo and that should work out okay. If you were a good few centimetres off then I'd weave up to where you're roughly near up to the 50 centimetre mark. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to show you how to unwind the cloth at the front that you've already woven and how we're going to get the red, that ready, folded and ready to be able to go in and do the join for the cowl. Right, so once you're sitting down and ready to get going, uh, then we'll start getting, getting this ready for weaving in. So if you've still got your shuttle attached, just break the yarn and what do we just pop the tail of that in for the next row. Pop that out a little bit. Bring that into beat. And then we'll just put, make sure the heddle's in the rest neutral position at the back. So in the Cricut, it's on this bit here. In the Ashford blocks, it'll be the middle block that you've got. So what we're gonna do, and it seems a bit strange to do for weaving, is we are going to unwind everything that we've woven already. So if you release the brake off the cloth beam, make sure the brake's still on in the back and we're just going to unwind all the cloth. As you see, it's always a fun bit with this, as you can see, I've woven those already. I'm going to keep those bits of paper. So we'll need those in a second. And then if you just untie all your ends that you got tied on at the beginning. So what we're going to be doing, we're going to be using the beginning section that we haven't woven, uh, which you should be able to see. So you've got woven cloth there. So you've got this big section here. This is what we're going to be using as the weft. So we just need to untie off all the front here. It's a bit dull, so we're just going to try and go as quickly as possible. Got lots of you to do. So again, this is also obviously tied tight knots at the beginning, so this is where it's a bit tricky sometimes to get them undone. But again, because you've got that nice loosened bit at the front, the tension does ease off a bit. And using those always nice because it is a little bit more 
not friendly than other yarns. But obviously you can use cottons, so you could easily use our Cassisol uh, cotton yarn, the L size for this, um, that would work well as a double knit weight and you could do use that for this pattern too, so that would work fine. Okay, so this is the last one. Right, so that's all unattached and this will seem like heresy that you have just totally unattached everything while you've still got your warp to weave on the loom. So you've got this nice long section here. Now what I do is I throw it just straight over to the back of the loom. And I then try and sort of even it out, try and keep it as straight and even as possible. And then just get it to fold over on itself. So you can see that's the bit going through the head of the warp and this is sort of the bit below for just woven. Now give this a bit of a try to see if that's going to catch on. So what we're going to do, we're going to make sure he breaks back on the pole. We're going to use apron rod to catch this fabric back around the cloth beam down here. So that's possibly not quite enough length, so I'll just give it a bit more. But you still need to have enough length on the other side to be able to get weaving along as well. So that seems all right. And again, as I said, if you try and even it up so you've got a fairly straightish edge. Now before we wrap it around the apron rod, what I do is a sandwich paper on either side. And this again just helps keep the tension to be even. So I've got cloth coming down here. And I've got a bit of paper there. So I'm going to have a other bit of paper there. And then we get the apron rod. And that, just tighten that up, that's going to sort of clink, on, clink onto it, that's the wrong word, catch onto it. And then just wind it on. And as you're winding on, again, make sure the brake's in. Should be tensioning up. Now, I know that's not caught well because I can feel the apron rod being loose underneath. Let's see. That's not quite good enough. Okay, so I think we just need a bit more fabric to come off that length to get going. Again, this is a very fiddly bit, so we'll just get rid of the paper for a minute and just take about another inch or so, a good few centimetres. That should hopefully go around. So you've got enough so as you see it will go, it should just start to get caught around as it's winding on. So that looks like that should be long enough. So we've got a bit of paper again to go under. And the reason for getting paper to go under as well as over is it helps to not get the cords or the plastic strips that you've got in the Ashford looms um, caught up underneath. So it's just, again, just to help keep everything all nice and tidy and it's just like tucking it in. And that's a bit better. Okay. And then what we can then do is we then just check and we see how straight our edge is because it should come up nice and straight if we've got the tension even but that's looking a little bit wonky so even if I fiddle about with it it's not too bad let's just beat that got edge in you can just sort of fiddle the warp yarns a bit until they're bang again feel what the tension's like like you did at the very beginning you're warping up, see if there isn't anything too bad, especially in the edges, and see sometimes the middle bits just get a bit more caught. It's more to do with where the lines are tied on with. I think we might just give that one more go. So you can go for this again and you can reposition it again, which is what I'm about to do. Okay, so I'm going to readjust this. So throwing it over the back again, and I'm just going to let off 
the break. And it is just more making sure. You can see, you can see how it's kind of grabbed on there. It's a little bit wonky. So even if you kind of look to sort of follow along the same sort of fell line row, as long as your rows are kind of neat. And again, make sure your edges kind of match up. And we'll just try this a second time. Paper is constantly falling off. What I might do, I might just unwind the apron rod a bit more. So it gives us a bit more play space. So catch that down and round and under. Put a break back in. Okay, and then I'm going to get the other bit of paper. Tuck that under. And then get the apron rod to come up and just sort of hug on. See if this is any better. Ah, that's much, much better. So as you can see, there isn't the waviness that we had before. It's a lot better, it's a lot straighter, and that feels quite a bit more even. Right, so that's us now at the position where we can now do the join. So if you look at your cloth, you can see the you've got the two different ends. You've got the ends with the mottled yarn, and you've got the ends with the solid colour yarn. Sorry, side that's got the mottled yarn, side with the solid colour green yarn. And if you follow it all the way through, then as it's sitting there, that's that side because it's got the mottled yarn in the warp, and that's the solid side because it's got the solid green in the warp there too. Now, if you were to just join it that way in with the green coming in straight onto the green side, it works fine, but you're not going to get a twist in the back of it. Now, it sounds weird to think, why am I twisting the fabric? If you twist the fabric, when you come to wear the cowl, and it sits on your neck, it's going to sit a lot better if it's got a twist round on it. It's just how it sits. So you can do it without the twist if you want, but it's better to do it with the twist in it. So instead, what to do is you just bring the fabric round and you get it so that the edge, the mottled edge side here, that's going to be the first side that's going to weave in. And again, it's easy enough to remember if you've got your whatever is on your left edge, that's the left hand side edge that's still on the loom that's going to be the first edge that you're going to weave in. So we kind of have it just sitting off the side and if we get our head on to the up position. And this is all going to be done by hand now. So there's no shuttles or anything like that. You just manoeuvre it in by hand. So what I've done is I've picked up very first warp thread that's coming along. So you do this in sequence, get one warp thread at a time. So we're in the up position because that's the next row. I might just tidy up before. That looks a bit better. And we get this first warp thread and we're going to pop it through. So set, just use your hands and pull it through and make sure nothing else gets tangled up. And if you bring it so it's just about to touch, you don't want it sort of like bunched too much up, but just so it's touching in. And again, just watch it doesn't go flying off. So it's just touching there. And then we bring the heddle in and beat night. See it's shifted a bit there, it's, it's dived back a bit, so I'll just go back into the up position, reposition it, and then bring it down. Okay, and then we go down to the down shed. So that's the first one in, and then we look to find the second one. So that's the second one in sequence, and then we just do this, move it in. And then you just get that lined up ready to go. And then we'll pull that down. And then beat in. And then go back up again. So you don't want this bunching up too much. You've also got to watch because it does obviously again put now put tension on the warp threads that are in here. So the trick is not to get this bit too bunched up. The other trick is also as you're beating that you're beating it in so it's at the same density as what it was woven as, um, as what it's sitting in here. So you kind of got a straight line following the way right the way along. So we'll do this next third one. And bring that down to beat. And uh, so just watch not getting too bumped up, bunched up down that end. So you see it's kind of bunching a bit, so I'll try and do this one a little bit looser.
see we've got straight lines kind of running along from the warp going right through the weft as it goes on through. So I'll take the next one now. Bring that down. Next one along. And again, just got to make sure you keep sort of pulling it along and it's not getting all bunched in because you can then end up getting it bunched in at this along this edge here along there. So I am still beating a bit too tight because it's not quite sitting in a straight line. So I'll start loosening it off again on this next one, which I'll try to. getting a bit better. And this is why it's quite good to have a stripe pattern so Lucy can help you to see what's going on and then it also creates the lovely effect that's happening in the cloth too. So you can see it's kind of coming together now, sort of straight line-ish. So next we've got the two, oh no, that's the end of the weft. It does get quite easy to sort of pick one thread from the next because you just have to watch where it's coming over um, in sequence from your cloth supply. Okay, and then the next one, does that stay there? Okay, so there we go, so you can see it's joined in. Now you don't need to worry about what's happening down this side here. That's just gonna do its own thing. That's just gonna, that we'll deal with that later and we'll get all that tightened up. So you can see now that you've got the nice effect of where the mottled threads are joining with the green. So we've now got the fun, exciting bit of two green threads coming in now. So we've got one going there. So once it's caught on a bit, the the warps are caught in, the, it is fine for it to lighten just slacken off down there. It's, the weight will be held by the warp threads as they're in the loom. Okay, so you can start to see the pattern starts coming off. Because this is it's a mottled yarn with a green, it is quite a faint pattern that comes through but it does work out quite nicely. So I'll just do, put the next two mottled threads in. Okay, so hope you can see the idea there so it's still it's got it so the trick is to keep the straight line coming and running along as much as you can from there to there there is a little bit of slack bowing in there but that might just work its way out if you beat in too hard and you don't get it following in it will cause tension issues along along that edge there for it's joining in together so it's better to try and sort of beat looser and make sure you're lining up with the lines that's coming in from the warp right the way through so I am going to continue weaving this up and when it comes to winding on, because I'll be doing that in a fast time lapse motion, just make sure as you're winding on you reposition the fabric so it's folded back over itself and then slacken off the back and wind on to the front. Uh, that way the fabric doesn't get all twisted up, but I might stop and show you that again in a second.
Okay, so I've stopped the fast weaving to show you what to do when it kind of gets a bit tricky and you're getting towards the end of the, the warp being unable to wind on. So if you make sure that you've got all your ends that are dangling off down that edge going fine, and again, just get your cloth, um, focus more on the, the vertical bit going up and down, but that's folded over nicely and then just loosen it off. Don't worry about this pair flying on the ground. And then wind up and that's all caught and it should hopefully be enough. And again, I was saying before, don't worry about the tension slacking off there. We are going to come and rescue that in a little bit. So I'm just going to finish weaving in this final section. I'm just going to bring that down a bit more. And again, just keep checking that you've got everything lined up nicely. And make sure, as I said, that you are picking up every single thread and sequence that you're not doing them out of sequence. If you do make a mistake and your thread are out of sequence, do go back and fix it because otherwise you do get twists and it can get a little bit, again, gnarly on the tension for the section that's coming in. That was the right one, wasn't it? Yes. And again, just watch, because as you see, as you go along, the, the weft from the early stage does bump up, but you can just smooth that out with your finger. And it is a feel about how tight you need to beat it. So it's just, so just keep checking that you've got your straight lines coming along as much straight as they can be as you're weaving it in. I was saying before, you can see now why you need the length at the back um, to make sure that you've got enough space to carry it all, to get it all woven in which we should do here. Uh, as I was saying earlier, if you want to make the cowl wider, you will need to adjust the amount of length that you're going to leave at the beginning to weave in and the amount of length that you need to leave at the end. So I would add uh, about five, five centimetres or so, probably per inch. Well, five, for every two centimetres that you're adding in, add in five centimetres. So for every inch, in length that you want to widen it by, add an inch at the beginning and at the end. And the reason for that is as you're weaving, the warp threads undulate. Um, so you need to make sure there's enough extra for take up and just to make sure you've got safety built in. Um, you can obviously adjust the length of the warp too, um, but you probably would need to if you're going to widen it because it's going to be a bit shorter in the amount of twist capacity that's available. That should be a new scientific term, twist capacity. Uh, so yeah, it is better to have a bit of a go and see how it does. I thoroughly recommend keeping notes of everything that you weave. Um, so if you put in your calculations for the width of the warp, the length of the warp, what yarns you've used, and then if you write down what it, it, the width was on the loom and how it behaved on the loom, um, the length, well, you don't have to do the length of the loom, the length when it comes off the loom and the width off the loom, and then after washing what it is. You've then got a good documentation of how the yarns behave and how different weaving techniques behave. So it is always really good to keep records. I've got loads of design notebooks. In fact, not even design notebooks, basically books of um, things what I have made it. Um, and I think we might try and get some so you can get some notebooks like that brought into the shop soon. Um, but it's very, very good to take notes. And I know it's dull and tedious, but whatever way you want to do it, whether it's digital on your phone or, you know, when, or you're just writing on bits of paper, just do write down what it is because it does help. And it helped for me trying to figure out how to get the right warp lengths and the right widths um, that work with the, with the cowls. And I wouldn't have been able to do that without having taken notes in each one, how to get it going. It's also a good thing because you can then colour in. So you can colour in your stripey patterns that you want to make as well. Um, and colouring in is always fun. Or you could use any other art medium that you wanted to as well to get that going. So we're just getting up to the final bit here. Just 
to these ones, so it does get a bit tight. I don't really want to wind up much more because then it's difficult to sort the edge, this edge out in a bit. So I'm just going to leave it there. Now, you see here it's bunching, you might not be able to see very clearly, it's bunching up here. So what to do, if it's bunched up quite a bit, you can just pull the weft a bit to give it a bit more space and you can help get it lined up. Again, that's quite common that happens because again, you've just, you've been changing the original weft yarn, which is going that way on this um, and you change intention on that. So it does make it sort of get a bit bunched up and then it gets a bit fiddlier to find the final couple of warp threads. This is where having small hands, oops, can be good. Now it's in the same shed. Don't want to do that. So we're just down to the last three. Now these are always the trickiest ones to find. So that's that one, definitely. Yep. Let's put that one through. And again, just watch, because it gets a lot looser at the end as you get in working up this side. Just watch that things don't start coming out that side either. So you've got a lot of things just to keep a count of. So there's one there. And then got the final one. Okay, so that's us. That's, that's the last one we can go through. So the trick is to make sure that everything is, as, as I said before, is lining up nicely. So you do need to just give everything a little bit of a sugar around to kind of get it lined up and even. If you've got that edge going in a straight line, you're you're winning already, so that's working out quite well. And if you've got box shapes forming that are roughly the same box shapes as what they were when we did them in the warp, then that works too. Now we do have a little bit longer going on at the back. That's okay, it should all work. Um, it just, we'll see how the cowl comes to fit on. Um, but it tries, this is why it's good to leave enough length, because as you saw, it's getting quite tight for doing those final threads. And there isn't that much more we can wind on because the join is there. If you start getting winding that a bit more around to the loom, it gets a bit trickier to handle. So what we're going to do now is we're going to sort out these edge warp threads and get those all nicely uh, twisted up. Okay, so what we're going to do now, um, I've changed it around so you can see a bit easier. We're going to do fringe twists all the way along this edge, which is then going to help to sort out the tension of the slacker edge of the warp here. And it also gives us a nice edge, ease, nice edge to finish. Uh, we do this edge first and then we'll cut off the back and then we'll do that back edge last. It is, you need to do this bit under tension because it just makes life a lot easier. And it, as I say, we're going to help sort of slacken up these threads here. So we're going to twist these up in bundles of four. So we're going to get, find warp threads in order. I'm just a bit trickier at this angle. So that's our first bundle of four there. And that's our second bundle of four there. So what you do with the bundles, I don't know if you can see very well, the angle of twist in this yarn is going that direction. So we'll just twist it up, let the first bundle go the same way. So you can see it's getting tighter. We'll try and count them in the number of twists there. Yeah, that's about eight. We do the same here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And if you hold the two of them together, and then just let them they twist back. And then you get a nice, very pretty fringe. All you need to do is then just put a little knot on the end of it. It's gonna work along to the next one. So there's the next bundle of four, and the next bundle of four. Now you might just be able to see that you can see this is where the warp threads are starting to splay. So you can just kind of push them back a bit and we'll do the twist again. It's so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You hold them together and let them twist back. Now it doesn't have to be eight. It's basically you twist it enough till it feels like it can't really twist that much more. And that gives you tension. And then you can just make sure the knots are roughly the same. 
And then we'll do nose bundle. Uh, can I count? One, two, three, four. Yep. And then one, two, three, four. And again, it's getting a bit easier to see now these outer warp threads. Now the easy ones are, because they're fairly similar in colour and I've got the multipleness, there isn't, there's a bit of, you can tell a bit of a difference between the ones with the mix and solid. If you're using two totally separate colours, this can give a really nice barber pole effect, which we do like. So there's four there. So then of course again, I'm just going to push out those outermost warp threads. back. So you kind of keep all the knots coming in at roughly the same place. You can readjust them afterwards but get them roughly the same. That makes it look nice. It's easy to make four and four. Going. You can see this bit here, because it's getting slack, we're just going to push those up. It's got this bit better aligned. And again, you can see you've got your straight lines coming down here, so that's looking good too. So again, watch, because as you can see this bit, it's kind of wandered off a bit, so we'll catch those up when we're there. So say make sure you've got the twist going in the same direction the twist is yarn because that just helps to over twist it. Well, let's do it itself. Obviously, fringe twisters are available. Uh, the shark fringe twister is a really nice, good one to use. Uh, the, there's also the Ashford one too that we sell. And if you've not as got issues with dexterity in the fingers, they're quite useful. Plus it's just quite useful and fun and handy to have. And there are videos on Shark Spindle's website and possibly Nasher's website on how to use them too. Basically all they do is you're clamping the ends into what crocodile teeth and then you're twisting it around. So it's doing the same thing, but just a bit more mechanically. Again, you're just gonna neaten up tension on the edge there. So you see that's jumped up quite a bit there and again make sure it's kind of coming roughly in a straight line. Fringe twist always gives a nice edge I think. So we've got this section there, one, two, three, four. Again, because it's getting a lot looser because this is towards the end, we'll just make sure these are tightened up and again. Let's pull these a little bit and straighten them out. Now, obviously, you can do the bundles in smaller fringe twisty bundles if you wanted. That's totally allowed. It is your cowl, your scarf. You can do whatever you want. This is just how I do it. Um, so, again, I'm just showing you how I do things. If you find another different technique or anything like that to do it, that's cool, that's fine. There are no weaving plates here. We are happy for you to do whatever works for you and how to get you to get it going, to get the finish that you want. These are just hints and tips to get it going. So this is a final set. Handily, it's worked out. It's another bundle of four and four. Uh, but again, like when tying on, if you had just six left, you could do a bundle of three and three. It's okay, it's fine, that works too. But we'll do a bundle of four and four. Let's twist that together. There. 
So that's that edge done. So as you can see, that has sorted out the slackness that was going down the edge. It is still a bit loose, but that's okay. We're not too bothered about that. That will sit fine once it's washed and it's all sorted. So what we can do now is we can now do the back edge. So I'll just adjust this a bit so we can see that slightly better. So what we're going to do uh, now, finishing right to do here is how you would finish off any other scarf anyway. So once you've woven enough, you, if you were just doing normal weaving of a scarf, you'd weave up to as far as you can weave, which probably would be about there, um, and then you just cut off. So you can get, as long as you've got a clear shed, you can keep weaving, but because we're doing this slightly differently, then we've done that. So if you get your pair of trusty scissors, and if you just cut along, make sure you don't cut any of the things that are holding the apron knot onto the loom. And just watch the tension just bounce back. Again, it doesn't matter if you're not quite even off on these because we'll even off the, the edge of the fringes later. So you can now just pull the heddle out and then you've got all your nice fringes sitting down here. So again, we're just going to start at this end and we do bundles of four again, exactly the same manner and again just following the twist. So see, if I was finishing off any scarf or blanket or anything else like that, then this would be how I would finish it off with a fringe twist, so either using a fringe twister or doing it by hand. If I've got lots and lots and lots of bundles of twist, I will get the fringe twister because my little fingers will get sore after it. So I'll just keep going. It's also again just quite nice and satisfying to do this to make sure that everything's lining up. Now you've got to watch because the very last roll that you wove, of, um, that does slacken off a bit so make sure you're keeping that nicely tucked in. I'm still twisting this out the same way so it's sort of eight twists to tension it up and then holding it back in itself. quite nice of doing it in this edge because at least you can lean on the back of the loom. And again, I prefer to do the fringe twisting when the loom's on under tension uh, and it just makes life a bit easier. If you're doing a scarf, obviously you've got this end to do and you've got the original bit that's stuck onto the apron rod at the beginning and um, you can't take it off at that point as well. Or if you take the whole thing off the loom and you weigh it down with some books or some heavy weight and um, that also helps to keep some weight in it to get the tension done for doing the fringe twist because when you're fringe twisting you have got a tendency to pull the warp yarns so if they're already being held under tension by the loom or by solid object on top of it then that stops them from shrinking and moving back or just you pulling them too tight so this is over halfway So still keeping in your bundles of four. These twists aren't as good as the other side. I think it's possibly me rushing it a bit, but it'll look the same at the end. And again, it's not too bad doing this when you're doing a scarf, but if you're doing it on a blanket, 
kind of set myself up for an hour or so of just twisting away the fringes. It's also good when you get to the side and you've actually got the same number of bunches and same number of threads as you did in the other. Obviously if you don't, it's not the end of the world. You can kind of, as long as you kind of pick one up with one bunch and the other, and it looks kind of okay, it's fine. Okay, so last bunch. So again, just make sure you're kind of tightening up that last row that was joined in. Okay, so that's it. So that's everything now secured and it's not going to run away. So what we're going to do now, we're just going to close up the break here and we can just take the cowl off. And there we go. We have our cowl join. Well, the snow flurry cowl. And just get the fringes to all sit out. Just move that up a bit. So you can see that's it all joined in. And you can see at the back that we've got the twisted section here. So it's not going to lie flat because it goes around in a Mobius twist. So you can see the twist is coming over there. And it's coming back down to there. Now, as I was saying before about the join section, just move that in a bit. See, this is a little bit loose and a little bit bumpy, bumpy. Um, so you just need to watch out with your tension on that. So what you can do to sort the tension out, you can just get your fingers in to just sort of move it down or just push that along. And it is just a thing to watch out for next time that you're just not adding it into. And so I think what happened is that was what was on at the beginning bit here. It just went a bit too far and it was looser off at this end. So again, just watch out when you're doing when you're doing that. When you're finishing it and you're washing it, wash it in a sink of water with some wool wash. Again, Farmer's Lavender wool wash that sells great for that. And then when you take out the wool wash, you just get the excess of water out by using a towel or using your spin cycling and washing machine in very low setting and then iron it and if once you iron it that should smooth quite a bit of that out as well okay so you have now woven your cowl and you've got it in this lovely shape like that so you can wear it two ways you can wear it draped across your shoulder like this so it's just quite nice for a summer's evening or the wave, which is the West Coast Bride way that you need to wear it around here for most of the year when it's windy. If you put the join section over your chest and then if you get the back edge of it and you can sort of see it's in a circle and if you twist that round and then bring it back down and over then it stays on, keeps your neck nice and cosy and make sure that you're all nice and warm and snug whenever you go outside for your walks or again you weave inspiration. I really hope that you've enjoyed following on how to do the cowl process and how to do the join. I also hope that you've enjoyed our previous two videos on warping and weaving. This isn't the end. We will have lots more videos coming online soon. And if you have any questions at all about this, put them in the comments below. But also do visit wefflowingcloud.com, which the link will be again in the comments below, uh, where we have our online community and we're more than happy to help you get weaving. If you've been watching this and you want to weave one yourself, then go to weftloan.com where you'll be able to buy a rigid head loom and also we do have the kits available for sale as well. So I hope you've enjoyed it and please do share what any of the curls that you've made as well. That'd be great. We'd love to see what you make.